Hello and welcome to News Central Now. I am Adebola Adejuba. The headlines. Nigerian workers down twos as labor begins industrial action. Russia's Foreign Minister Lavrov visits Junta-led Guinea. South African opposition to break ANC's 30-year majority in Parliament. And details shortly. Let's begin with updates on the labor strike. Striking workers have downed twos across the, the nation as the Nigeria Labor Congress and the Trade Union Congress begin their industrial action over the hike in electricity tariff and a lack of consensus on a new minimum wage. While the National Assembly had stepped in at the last minute to avoid the industrial action declared on Friday, the discussions ended in a stalemate leading to the commencement of the strike. In compliance with the order, some workers in several parts of the country were shut out of their offices. From the federal capital territory Abuja, Abia in the southeast, Boronu in the northeast, down to Lagos in the southwest, the workers' actions grounded activities economically. Activities in banks and other financial institutions were also disrupted as the staff were not allowed to get into their offices by the labor union officials. Let's also tell you that organized labor has closed all entry points to aviation agencies at Maritala Muhammad International Airport in Ikeja, Lagos, and Nnamdi Ezekiel International Airport in Abuja to demand the implementation of a new national minimum wage. This action has led to significant disruptions in flight operations at the nation's busiest airports, leaving passengers stranded at the entrances. The disruption comes just 24 hours after aviation unions directed their members to withdraw services across airports in Nigeria. This is MM2 gate. No. The activities at the airport here uh, just have been grounded. The airport has been picketed by the members of the NLC and TUC. I have here with me Emmanuel Jaja, who is the deputy president of uh, ATSAN. And ATSAN is the uh, Air Transport Services uh, Senior Staff Association of Nigeria. Mr. Emmanuel, can you tell us the level of compliance by your members? Yes, um, all our members are here, both the public and private sector, we are all here. You can see FAN is here, NCA, Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority is here, NAMA is here, AIB is here, private sector, we have Bristol, we have Pan Africa. Mention them all over, we are all here. And what, what, what is the hope that either this, uh, this strike will soon be called off or the hope that the demands by the TUC or NLC will be met? Is there anything that gives to uh, that uh, uh, fact? Well, we are affiliated to Trade Union Congress of Nigeria, TUC, and some of other members here are also affiliated with Nigerian Labor Congress. So we'll continue to be here till we get, we get directive from our labor centers in Abuja. So at the moment, there is no signal, no information to the possibility of calling off the strike? Negative. At this moment, no information, so we'll continue. You can see we're already preparing for how to continue tomorrow again. It's called an indefinite strike. So we'll continue till maybe we'll see if government can come off with their shells. Because, you know, we are dealing with government that are not sincere. The question we are asking is, what can 60,000 Naira do with a man, with a wife and two children? Usually, what we usually have in the past is a man, a wife, and four children. We have reduced it to two. If the government can explain to us what 60,000 can afford with a man, his wife, and his two children, with the inflation rate of things, prices of goods and commodities skyrocketing, with the electricity bill going on, with the high cost of fuel, with all this, with the high cost of dollar. So if they tell us what 60,000 can do, then we'll come back and sit down and begin to discuss. Abia State's workforce have embarked on an indefinite industrial action in compliance with the directive of the National Labor Union. The state chairman of the Nigeria Labor Congress, Obunaya Okoro, and the company of some labor leaders were in some government establishments to enforce compliance. He said labor will only back down after the federal government missed its demand of 400,000 naira minimum wage. Meanwhile, some residents of Umwaya have shared their opinions about the development. About to do the needful. After a long, protracted meeting, 
with the organized labor, NSC and TUC, the federal government in their own self have failed to be considerate. They have failed to take the, the welfare of workers of Nigeria into consideration. And the, the joint labor force, the NSC and TUC, have directed for a total shutdown all over the nation, both federal establishment, state establishment, local government, private sector, be it in the parastatals or agency, they are all involved. What is the work and the number of people around enter the office? In Bronu State, the Nigerian Labor Congress and Trade Union Congress have enforced a compliance with indefinite nationwide strike. The Bronu State chapter denied the head of service access to the state secretariat and locked down various government agencies, departments, and parastatals. Our correspondent, Umaru Kirawa, brings us updates. The strike action comes amidst unresolved issues between the labor unions and Nigeria's federal government. Leadership of both the NLC and TUC in Borno State, in company of some labor leaders, were in some government establishments to enforce compliance. Agencies, departments and parastatals have been effectively locked down, grinding government operations to a standstill. There is total compliance with the workers of Borno State. Where we visited, we were able to visit uh, one of the federal institutions, federal training, industrial training fund, where we met them working and we asked them to leave. We've chased them out, we've locked the gate and asked them to leave the premises. So based on our assessment today, there is total compliance. We don't have problem and then the monitoring will continue up to tomorrow, up to the end of the strike. As the strike enters its critical phase, there are growing calls for swift action by the federal government to address the grievances of the workers and restore normalcy. It's sad, but on a good note, we're happy that labor are trying to put things in place. Uh, but on a sad note, we're trying to make travels, and this is so crucial. We call on, on the, the required identities to ensure that this is put in place. Grounding travel has a lot to do with the entire economy of the whole nation. So we call on the required people to have to do things quickly. It's sad that everyone is here to travel, and then everything is grounded. So sad. Sad. What a nation like this. Sad. This strike has effectively shut down administrative activities across Borno State as public servants have been forced to withdraw their services. We have been with you since in the morning. We went to the Musa Osman Secretary. In fact, we even denied the head of service and the Secretary of the State Government entering to the Secretariat. However, there was vehicular movement and businesses ongoing in the state capital with hospitals providing skeletal services. We will go and relax and then continue receiving report from various athletes so that tomorrow we pick from where we say where there is challenges, we continue from there. The Nigerian workers are protesting the non-implementation of the new minimum wage and other unmet welfare demands by the federal government. The Borno State Head of Service was denied access into the state secretariat here in Maiduguri, the Borno State capital, and the organized labor maintained that until matters are settled, such effort will be continued within the state and beyond. In Maiduguri for News Central, Omori Kirawa. There was total compliance of the nationwide strike by the organized labor in Asaba Delta State, South South Nigeria. The union executives and affiliate members led by the state chairman, Trade Union Congress, went round to Asaba, the state capital, to enforce the total compliance among workers. Workers were forced out of the offices by the compliance team, led by the TUC and NLC officials. Speaking on the nationwide strike, the union leaders said Nigerians are facing a lot of economic challenges, coupled with subsidy removal that is biting hard on daily needs. Hence, the federal government should listen to the demands of the people. And to talk about this, I'm joined live on the news by public affairs commentator, Benga Ayonuga, and as well as our correspondent, Austin Azu, who is in Delta State. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Glad to have you both join me. Good uh, let me start, Thank you for having me on. Let me start with Austin Azu in Delta State. Mm -hmm. Austin, what's the latest over there? Uh, currently, I'm standing uh, front of the state secretariat. The place is totally locked down. And uh, as usual, this place 
uh, ought to be beehive activities at this time of the day because they expected that civil servants might be making their ways out of this uh, secretarial complex. And opposite secretarial complex is a central bank of Nigeria, Delta State branch. Before now, this place at this time of the day is always a beehive of activities. A lot of persons will be going home and some other persons will be making their last preparations for the day to leave the offices. But at this time around right now, the road is dried. Uh, mm. The vehicles are very, uh, the tricycles are limited. So it means that there's a total compliance here in Delta State, particularly in Asaba, precisely. Earlier on in the day, earlier on in the morning, we had the officials of the TUC and NLC moving around the government offices and even commercial banks to enforce compliance. Places they went to include the Secretariat, the Federal Secretariat, the State House of Assembly Complex. They went to the FMC, the Federal, Federal Medical Center, the Specialist Hospital, and other offices that the TUC and NLC members went to. And of course, they asked, the mem they asked their members to withdraw their services. And of course, the people who were on admission, patients, were asked to relocate from the hospital to a private hospital. And of course, they equally said that the compliance, uh, they, they appreciated their workers, some of them who did not, you know, uh, fail to comply with them. And the session, those who came to work in the morning and they were forced from their offices and they said the monitoring of the exercise continues probably tomorrow and mm. subsequently across the states. So ju ju just hold your thoughts there, Austin. So let me go to Benga. I'll come back to you, Austin, in, in a moment. Uh, Benga, how do you see the, this you know, collective bargaining agreement? How does it influence the decision to take industrial action? And what role do union leaders play in this process? Well, I think the collective bargaining at this moment shows that the union leaders have uh, learned from their previous mistake and they have been able to put their house in order first before going to the government. And the fact that government is not taking them uh, serious with the way they are bargaining with them is making the union in the sympathy of those who normally would have sagged with government, those who normally would have felt that uh, the union leaders are not serious. But because of the way the government handled the process of bargaining, it has shown to all workers out there, to the extent that there are several police officers that I met today uh, on my way to work before being sent back uh, that were of the opinion that I mean, they were saying it in Yoruba, and I was hearing when they said they are asking us to go and maintain order when these people are actually fighting for us, which kind of order they expect us to maintain. And this is the kind of thing you hardly hear from police of all people. It shows that, in a way, even police officers who would have been unleashed on these um, striking workers are also this time around siding with the workers. So I think that the labor union leaders have done their own work very well. And the fact that the hunger in the land, the inflationary rate in the land is hitting everybody home. And if they had wanted to go their separate way and say, we are not joining the TUC, we are not joining the NLC, they know that when they get home, uh, their take home will not be able to take them home currently. Which so leads me to my next no uh, question, Benga. If I may, just to chip in there, which what you said just now uh, leads my next question, which is, what is the economic consequence of this prolonged or prolonged uh, industrial action on the affected industry, and how that might this impact the broader economy? There is no economic consequence that we have not already been facing. They will tell you that, oh, we are going to lose a lot of money uh, from the industrial action, but we are already losing a lot of money because Nigerians don't have purchasing power to uh, purchase product that they need for daily living. Take, for example, there are many uh, fast moving uh, commodity goods uh, companies who are complaining that many of their products are getting destroyed in their warehouse because people cannot afford to buy them. So product that ought to move out of the warehouse at a speed of maybe uh, 10 cartons per day are moving out of their warehouse at a speed of, say, one carton per day. So there is no economic consequence that they, the government, would want to explain that would be the response from this strike. 
that we are not already facing. Hmm. So no. I think the government needs to sit itself down and be sincere with itself. Did you know that if government had negotiated around the hundred one twenty thousand with if, labor if, and the OST insisting on that? Mr. Ayonuga, because I still have a couple of questions for you and we're pressed for time. Uh, talking about the government, in what way can the federal government and also workers negotiate to resolve disputes and avoid industrial action? First and foremost, government should show seriousness by the quality and quantity of their representative when they are meeting with labor union. We saw that when they were meeting with labor union, they were only sending permanent secretaries, which they they can deny uh, that the, the agreement made with such permanent secretary is binding. Why can't the Minister of Labor meet with labor union leaders? Why are they sending permanent secretaries? Secondly, is they must be able to realistically agree. When we first start the issue of um, minimum wage in 1980, I wish we had more time. Uh, this is where we have to end this conversation. On the news, apologies for butting in there. Well, thank you so much for your insight on the news. Benga Ayonuga, public affairs commentator, as well as our correspondents there in Delta State, Austin Azu. Thank you both, gentlemen. You're live with News Central TV. Let's take a short break. Stay with us. Thank you for staying tuned. Commanders from the Nigeria Army School of Supply and Transport have converged on Benin City, the Edo State capital, to deliberate on ways they can reposition the cause. The cause commander of the Nigeria Army Corps of Supply and Transport says the 2024 conference will offer the cause an opportunity to explore, interrogate ideas from all cause commanders across the country as they strive to achieve the goals and objectives set by the chief of the Army staff. Um, the Commander Supply and Transport Conference provides an avenue for all supply and transport officers across the country to come and reassess their performance towards achieving the command philosophy of our Chief of Army Staff, Chinan General T. A. Lagwaja, Nagana Medal, to ensure that our activities, our work, our thinking, our preparation, and our training are all geared towards optimally delivering on our tasks and responsibilities, but heavily guided by his command philosophy. Flooding has been the most common perennial disaster in Nigeria, especially between 2012 and 2022. Floods usually have a devastating impact, especially on the poor and vulnerable population who live in low lands and along the riverbanks of the River Niger and Benue across Nigeria. In this report, News Central's Austin Azu seeks to examine preparations of those living in flood-prone areas ahead of this year's predicted flood by the Nigerian Meteorological Agency. The Nigerian Meteorological Agency had in the first quarter of the year predicted severe flooding along the coastal region of Nigeria with early warning to those living along the river banks of the River Niger and Benue to heed early warnings to mitigate its impacts. According to experts, the worst flood incidents we experienced in 2012 and 2022, when hundreds of thousands of homes, public utilities and farmlands were destroyed, resulting in several deaths. According to the World Bank Global Rapid Post-Disaster Damage Estimation Assessment, the total economic damage to residential and non-residential buildings, infrastructure, the productive sector and farmlands from the 2023 floods was estimated at $6.6 .6 billion. Why the 2012 and 2022 floods were caused by the release of excess water from the Lagdo Dam in Cameroon, others were attributed to the indiscriminate disposal of waste materials, especially of waterways, drainage channels, and buildings on floodplains, which made it difficult for the free flow of water at the peak of rainfall in the country. But how are those living in flood-prone areas in Delta State taking Naimit's prediction and warnings? What we are doing is that, let's assume that you are planting about, say, 2,000 seedlings of yam. You understand? Because of the flood, you will plant only 1,000. So that when the flood comes, you'll be able to avert them and take them, whether they are pre uh, ready or not ready. We are sorry for, uh, for the flood too much. And we don't need the flood too. So if you people can do the flood, make it no come, we will like them because we are sorry for it. We are preparing, actually, just like the information is spreading. 
But we are expecting that the government will assist in any way possible, knowing fully well that, is, that will be a proactive action to see where, in terms of if everything becomes so intensified, whether some villagers can be located to some other places. In the same vein, the state government has said adequate, coordinated and effective flood in mitigation strategies and preparedness have been put in place across the state to advance casualties and destruction of farm produce and property. We've reached out to those who are living in flood-prone area, we've reached out to directors in general, and we are still consistently sensitizing the general public. So we are prepared. The committee is essentially set up last year. The committee is still fully intact. They will be the one to take charge when the time comes. Since flooding has become an annual disaster that has continued to ravage homes, farmlands and property, consuming citizens' lives in the process, the federal government and relevant stakeholders should come together to develop a roadmap that will provide a lasting solution to the perennial flood disaster to build more dams at the tributaries of the River Benway as well as dredge the River Niger to curtail excess water released from the Cameronian Dam that has continued to wreak havoc on the country. In Asaba, for News Central, Austin Azu. Education has been described by many people as the bedrock of meaningful development in any society. If education continues to go down the drain, a standard will also be truncated. And this was the crux of the events at Kanem local government area of Plateau State, where two blocks of classrooms were built and presented to a community that has never had one in its history. Our correspondent Chizoba Anionwe tells us more. It is usually said that children are the leaders of tomorrow. Unfortunately, it seems to be mere words on the lips of many people in our society. If not so, how would one understand that governments have come and gone, yet this community has existed for many years without a single classroom. Instead, pupils, or rather children in this case, gather under trees for learning to take place. This is probably what moved the Commissioner for Local Government and Chieftaincy Affairs in Plateau State to pull this stride in this community. Despite blocks of classrooms, he pledged to do more. Definitely, because we have come up with this structure, we are going to give them uniforms, give them writing materials, give them books. We have done that in the past within the local government, so I am going to, uh, to give them a lot of books that will aid them in their writing. Thinking about the partnership where the private and public sectors synergize to improve the standard of education, some residents think it is a step that needs to be harnessed if education will be improved upon in Plateau State. I'm calling on all sectors, both private, individuals, parents, and even the civil society. We should put our hands together to support the efforts of the government so that education will stand in Nigeria, we stand in Plateau State. If the people can cooperate with the government, I think the time is now. I advise the people to cooperate with government so as to see how we move the state forward in terms of education. We also use the medium to call on the suburb to come our, to our aid by completing the remaining four classrooms with office to us. And if possible, if there is facility on ground, they should assist us. Because right now you can see the primary school, there's no seat, no blackboard and other facilities that the students need it. Pledging to furnish the new classrooms, the chairman of suburb on the plateau says this intervention would aid in reducing the number of out-of-school children in the state. Certainly we have out-of-school, uh, cases of out-of-school children in Plateau State. And through such interventions, we'll be able to bring down the number. You know, we cannot eradicate it completely, but at least through such uh, intervention, we'll be able to trim down the number. And that is what we're working on. That's the goal. Surely, the joys of these pupils will not be complete if these new classrooms remain empty without any form of furniture or learning aids until the words of these stakeholders materialize into actions. In Jaws for New Central, 
Chizoba Anyoui. The federal government said it has commenced measures to ensure efficiency and reliability of health supplies procurement across Nigeria. This thus says to enhance health procurement systems is part of strategies to improve healthcare delivery in the country. Director General of Bureau of Procurement, Maman Hamadou, disclosed these at a poor procurement workshop in the Federal Capital Territory. Our correspondent, Imanu Bogodo, tells us more. These are relevant stakeholders comprising both government and non-governmental organizations brainstorming on ways to effectively use the pool procurement tool to enhance Nigeria's healthcare delivery system. The Director General of the Bureau for Public Procurement highlighted several initiatives put down by government for health procurement. Implementation of e-procurement platform, strengthening regulatory oversight, capacity building and, push and professional development, and commitment to sustainable practices. Also, the Coordinating Minister of Health and Social Welfare, who was represented by the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry, says that the government has continued to work round the clock to improve procurement of essentials needed in healthcare sector so as to improve access to healthcare for all citizens. The Federal Ministry of Health has implemented several policies and strategies to strengthen our health products procurement and supply chain system through the years. And this is motivated by the desire to create a patient-oriented supply chain master to achieve high levels of efficiency and effectiveness in the delivery of medicines and other health products to the people of Nigeria. Other stakeholders present took time to highlight the importance of the pool procurement tool, especially in the health sector. Pool procurement is more than just a strategic approach. It's a transformative tool that can significantly impact our healthcare system when it is correctly utilised. By leveraging collective uh, purchasing power, we can achieve economies of scale, ensure consistent quality of supplies, and secure better pricing. You can see manufacturers making investment because they want to support that procurement activity. And what that means is their capacity is improving. Some of them can look at what they have to expand. And ultimately, by doing that, you are contributing to economic development because you have suppliers. It is hoped that the outcome of this event will lead to more transparency in procurement exercises in the health sector and subsequently improve access to health care in Nigeria. In Abuja for New Central, I am Emmanuel Bagudu. Foreign Minister Lavrov visits Junta led Guinea. We have details after the break. Join us again. Thank you for staying with us. The news continues in West Africa, where Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov visited Guinea on Monday on the first leg of an African tour aimed at betrayal Moscow's influence in the continent. Russia, which has seen its relations with the West plummet after it sent troops to Ukraine in 2022, has sought to boost its influence in Africa in recent years. Russia's foreign ministry announced visits on the Telegram social media app with a photo of Lavrov arriving in Conakry airport overnight, his first visit to Guinea since 2013. Lavrov is due to meet Guinness junta leader Mamadi Domboya in power since the 2021 coup. In Southern Africa, South Africa's ruling ANC African National Congress has lost its 30-year grip on an outright majority in parliament, according to official results announced on Sunday. The ANC secured only 159 seats in the 400-seat National Assembly, garnering 40% of the vote. The centre-right Democratic Alliance followed with 87 seats, amounting to 22% of the vote. In a surprising third place was a newly formed Mkwoto Wisizwe party, led by former president Jacob Zuma, which captured 14.59% of the vote and 58 seats. President Cyril Maposa and leaders from most rival parties attended the result announcement, except for Zuma, who denounced the election as rigged 
and refused to participate. Staying in South Africa, where the round was trading at its strongest on Monday morning against all the three major foreign currencies, at 13.70 rand, so US dollar, against the US dollar compared to last Friday's open rate of 18.76 at 23.76 rand against the UK pound sterling compared to last Friday's open rate of 23.87. Economists say despite the 2024 election result, the run paints a good picture for the economy. And to talk about this, I'm joined by Bonke Demisia, who is an independent economist. Good afternoon from here. Glad to have you join me. Yes, I'm happy to be here again on News Central, uh, broadcasting all over the, the continent of Africa. Okay, let me start by asking you, what are the key factors that will determine the RAND's performance in the coming weeks? Under normal circumstances, when we look at the RAND's performance, just like any other currency, you look at political certainty and you look at economic certainty. And when you're talking about political certainty, you are talking about political stability. And when you're talking about economic certainty, you're talking about economic stability. So what happened? The RAND were very happy in the month of May because normally before the elections, you, you have the currency uh, being weakened because people do not know what was happening. And you found that you were in a situation where global investors were more optimistic about the South African elections than the local people. And the, the, the RAND was at its strongest in th this year since last year in 2023. And then when the voting took place and the, ele the election results started coming up, some of the parties, I'm not really going to go into the names, some of the parties which were coming up with a lot of populist uh, rhetoric where they were literally promising everything to everyone for free as if money grows on trees and at the same time, those people were, were saying that they will get rid of the South African constitution, which, which is the cornerstone of our democracy. And they, they will also get rid, they will nationalize the South African Reserve Bank, which is really respected all over the world for its independence and pragmatism. Then we saw the rand moving from, on Tuesday, the 28th of um, May, the rand was at 1876 to the US dollar. And by Friday, by Thursday, the 30th of May, it had weakened to 1851 to the US dollar. And by Friday, it had weakened even more to 18 US dollar 76 to, to the dollar. And that was really bad. And then yesterday, as they were re releasing the election results, we had some of the political party leaders who were very much against the ANC and were saying that the ANC must, must disappear and must be removed. All of a sudden, they, they had some reconciliatory things to say about working closely with the ANC and the Mr. And Demisa, other yes i'm afraid that's the most we can take but thank you so much for your insights on the program bonke Demisa, independent economist thank you once again for your perspective and now let's connect live to abuja where the ministry of information is holding the conference on the industrial action but first we'll take a short break stay with us sustainable regarding this minimum wage negotiations. We therefore make this passionate appeal once again to the labor unions to reciprocate this gesture in the interest of this nation. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, With me of course here is the 
Honorable Minister of Labor, a Minister of State Labor, and the Special Advisor to the President on Information and Strategy. Uh, let me reiterate that we will continue to engage with Labor. We are waiting for them. We have extended invitation to them, and government will continue to engage with them in the interest of our nation. Ours is a democracy, and whatever solution we have must be along the fashion of democratic ideals. Thank you. Yes, I just want to add that the government has continued to show good faith because we don't have any other country apart from this uh, uh, Nigeria, uh, uh, about, apart from Nigeria. And uh, in the interest of uh, peace and progress of this country, I plead with the Nibo Union that they should reconsider and come back to the issue because I believe that uh, we have duties. Good, the labor union and organized private sector and of course government side to come to conclusion because we can't allow our nation to get into crisis as we speak. Um, what has happened today has brought a lot of hardship in Nigerians and we can, uh, everybody is feeling it. All the people that can't eat unless they get out of their house to find something to eat. People are hurting and if we are going to uh, help the people who are hungry, we shouldn't uh, uh, make it more hard for them. So I think we never will speak to my brothers and my sisters. Please come back to the initiative table and uh, make sure that we resolve this. This can be resolved. Thank you very much. So, um, I think perhaps in the absence of any questions, any or you can take two questions. Please, uh, your name and your medium. Question. We have to be more convincing. Yes. Our word is very often anchor and correspond with the challenge of the question is to flow. Now, earlier the AGF has said the Hong Kong strike actually is illegal. So I just want to know what the situation is about that claim that the ADF is with the government. And they think that AM has a situation with the ongoing negotiations going on. And secondly, is the government willing and ready to improve its offer with the organized labor and to what amount if it is that sir? Well, I don't want to speculate at this point. Um, you, let me take your second part, uh, the second part of your question. The tripartite agreement is still there. It has not been disbanded. Indeed, it is Labour that actually stepped out of that meeting. Uh, we are appealing to them to come back. Whatever appeal they have can still be made during those uh, uh, meetings. Uh, you know that the tripartite uh, committee has three parts, as, as the name suggests. The government side has the federal government, the subnationals, meaning the state governments and local governments, the organized Labour, Nigerian Labour Congress, Trade Union Congress, and their affiliates. And then we have the organized private sector, made up of Nasima, um, you know, NECA, and, and, and all the rest. So, two of them are already moving in the same direction. It is Labour that has stepped out of this agreement. We are appealing to Labour to come back to the negotiating table. Once that is done, we believe that an amicable uh, solution can be found. The government has not closed its doors on anything. What government has offered is his own position, realistic position. If Labour feels that that is still not okay, there's still an opportunity for them to come back to the negotiating table and talk to the two other two parts of the, of, of the committee. And then we believe that we are all Nigerians. And like the Honorable Minister here said, an amicable solution is available for all of us. We need to seize it, we need to take it. Strike is not the only way out. Now, the other part of your question regarding what the AGF has said. The AGF has given uh, what the federal government position is. But at this point, what is important for all of us as Nigerians is to come together. We believe that this labor uh, movement also means well for Nigerians. After all, the negotiation they are doing, uh, according to them, is also on behalf of Nigerians. So let them come together, join hands with other parts of Nigeria 
so that we can all come together and fashion out a correct wage regime, agreeable, sustainable, and doable for all. Thank you. Any other? Okay, uh, Yes, sir. sister. I know that in the past, uh, the past government had earmarked several sectors, uh, irrespective of strikes. We know that these sectors has grave consequences, especially some of them national security, uh, national security implications. The invasion sector, the national grid, the, the transmission sector, and it has been agreed that even if there is a strike, these sectors should run interest of the country. But we have seen that in the last 24 hours, the national grid has been shut down, the airports have been shut down. How important are you as a minister in the government? Because this runs contrary to lay down what has been laid down in the past. Well, uh, let me say that government is really bordered. Uh, it is the responsibility of government to protect lives and property of Nigerians. Indeed, that is the first role of any government. But let me also say that in the spirit of reconciliation, because we also want to forge ahead, we want everyone to come back to the negotiating table. Our emphasis is not on that now. Our emphasis is to appeal to labor, get them back to the table so that we can find a solution to the emperors. We don't want to go to uh, who is wrong or who is right at this point. The position of government is that let labor come back to the negotiating table we find an amicable uh, solution. But I agree with you that labor, I mean, federal government has a responsibility to protect lives and property and to ensure that every citizen has the right to free movement, to work, and to every other entitlement as enshrined in our constitution. But the emphasis now is to come together so that we can resolve the emphasis. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Any other? Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to um, ask Adams. Uh, I report for Nigeria. Um, organizations such as um, the Sultan of Sokoto and um, Khan has also issued statements appealing to Nepal uh, Nepo to share his um, um, action. Uh, what would be your appeal to leaders of notes, uh, of, uh, fathers of the country, and to impress on them um, uh, the organized labor? Well, my appeal to them, like you have said, they have already started. Uh, like you have said, the, the Sultan of Sokoto and the representative of uh, the Christian Association of Nigeria has made this passionate appeal already to them. We want to call on all other leaders to please impress on them that this is our country, all of us, all of us as stakeholders in this project called Nigeria. When the national grid goes off, it is not about APC, PDP, Labour Party, or any other party for that matter. It is about Nigeria. The national grid that is available is not along party lines. It's not along religious lines. It's not along ethnic lines. It is about Nigeria. So when Labour takes action, it affects all of us. My appeal to leaders all across this country, religious, political, social, opinion, Whatever leader is there to appeal to Labour, to reconsider their position, come back to the table so that together we can fashion out what is best for our country. I think this is the message that we need to put out there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming around. <laughs> And that's a press conference being held by the Ministry of Information where the Minister of State, Labor and Employment in Kiru Kaunye, Georgia, was present, is present rather, as the press conference is still ongoing. And they talked about the need for Labor to reconsider uh, extending an oilish branch to Labor for negotiation and to call off the industrial action. And that's all under the use of this album. Before we go, let's take a look again at some of the major stories. Nigerian workers have downed twos as labor begins its industrial action. Russia's Foreign Minister Lavrov has visited Junta-led Guinea. 
We also told you that South African opposition has broken the ANC's 30-year majority in Parliament. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen and follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV Channel 422, Star Times Channel 274, Abo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Adebola Adejuba.